He's a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, and we thank him for all his service. Two men at the center of a national disgrace, a war veteran from a Nazi unit, and the speaker who asked the House of Commons to honor him. I accept full responsibility for my actions. After Anthony wrote his resignation, there are questions about the role of the speaker and whether new rules are needed. Jeff Regan knows a lot about that position. He was House Speaker from 2015 to 2019, just before Anthony Rota. And, and Jeff, from the perspective of a former speaker, what's your reaction to, to what went wrong here? Well, um, look, I feel very badly for my friend Anthony uh, with the way this worked out, but I think everyone acknowledges this was a very serious error. And we're all, I mean, I can think of the thousands, well, I don't want to think of the thousands of errors I've made in my life. Uh, but haven't we all? Uh, this was a very serious one, and I certainly understand his decision to, with, to resign. Uh, but people are asking really about how do you avoid this, and there's been a lot of talk about whether it, you know, this, is it a security risk. I don't think that it's a security risk issue here. And so the, the Parliamentary Protective Service uh, would look at the list of people who are coming and assess whether they have a criminal record, whether there are outstanding warrants for them, whether they are a, a security risk which doesn't appear to have been the case here. The question is, what happens in terms of a political risk or an international relations risk? And that's always been where the speaker and the speaker's staff have to watch out for those sorts of things. But, you know, a lot of people are wondering, how, how does a mistake like this be made, even if it is just, a, a, you know, not a security matter, but a matter of perception and politics and decency, some would say. Well, you know, a simple Google search might have avoided this problem. So, so how do you think this happened? Uh, I, look, I think those questions have been addressed uh, to Mr. Rhoda, and I think that I have to leave that to him to answer that. Speakers are members of Parliament campaigning in the election for their party. Rhoda is a Liberal MP. You were too. Um, is there anything that happened here that's the responsibility of the Prime Minister? Uh, look, I think that this raises an important issue, and, and that really is uh, that the executive reports to the House of Commons. And why is that important here? Is because the Speaker is, of course, the servant of the House of Commons and also the representative of the House of Commons. And so the Speaker makes the decisions about the, uh, invitations and, and, and um, basically what happens in the House of Commons. It's not the Prime Minister's job to do that. So I have a real problem with the idea that the Prime Minister's office control things in the House of Commons, right? They have, the, the, the government side has influence in terms, according to the rules of the House of Commons, but it shouldn't be controlling things and it shouldn't be directing the Speaker because, you know, the reason that we're a democracy in sense, I mean, the Speaker's central role in the democracy is to make sure that the government reports to the House of Commons, not the other way around. In terms of making sure something like this doesn't happen again, do you have any advice for the, the next speaker? I think that members of parliament uh, will be discussing this and are discussing this and will come up with lots of ideas. Any speaker obviously has to be careful with this sort of thing uh, and show good judgment. Uh, but the, the, the House itself may make decisions about how to deal with this going forward. Members of parliament, I think, will undoubtedly have lots of good suggestions for the new speaker. Chef Regan in Stanhope, Prince Edward Island this evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. The incident in Parliament has also raised questions about Canada's past. Thousands with Nazi ties settled here after the Second World War. Ellen Morrow looks at how easy that was and how little has been done about it since. That moment brought attention to a really difficult truth. Canada has been home to many, some historians say thousands of people who fought for the Nazis. How did that happen? After the Second World War, Europe was in ruins. So there was a flood of emigration, with tens of thousands coming to Canada. And despite the horrors of the Holocaust, historians say keeping out Nazis and their collaborators wasn't necessarily the top priority for Canadian immigration officials. 
anti-communism trumped anti-Semitism. Professor Jan Grabowski says Cold War fears and anti-Semitism helped give some former Nazi troops a way in. In the late 1940s, you have a clear preference for people who have proven record of fighting against the communists. And many officials were quite eager, actually, to uh, turn their head away uh, and not to see the crimes related to their activity. Yaroslav Hunka, the man in Canada's parliament, served in the Waffen-SS Galizia Division, Ukrainian volunteers who joined Hitler's troops to fight Soviet Russia. After surrendering to the British, many of the division's soldiers were eventually transferred to Canada. Others who came to Canada lied or withheld information about their Nazi backgrounds or identities to get in. Helmut Rauka used his middle name when he arrived, becoming a Canadian citizen in the 50s. 30 years later, he was extradited to what was then West Germany, linked to the murders of 10,500 Jewish people. But overall, extraditions have been rare, and prosecution in Canada nearly impossible, experts say, because of a legal decision in 1994. Imre Finta was accused of organizing the deportation of more than 8,000 Jews to Nazi prison camps. Finta was charged under Canada's criminal code, but acquitted. His defense, that he was following the orders of a superior. The Finta case ruined the whole effort to bring Nazis to justice. Efraim Zuroff has spent decades tracking down alleged war criminals around the world. Once Canada accepted it, that's it, goodbye. You can't bring anybody to court and convict them because they'll all say the same thing. The DeShane report says there are people living in Canada who should be prosecuted for Nazi war crimes. In 1985, under pressure, Ottawa set up a public inquiry on how many alleged Nazi war criminals had settled in Canada and what the government should do about it. It's really hard to have a full sense of what the commission found. The whole second half of its report, believed to contain the names of alleged war criminals, has never been made public. Historians and advocates for the Jewish community say that's a problem. If we disregard history, it bites us very strongly on the neck. I hope this scandal will explode this veil of secrecy. The sooner we can look at history straight in the eye, the better for everybody. Let's talk more about this with Bernie Farber, the former CEO of the Canadian Jewish Congress, most of his father's family killed by the Nazis at the Treblinka death camp. Uh, Bernie, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me in. Uh, Yaroslav Hunka went in a matter of days from, from being called, and th these are quotes, a war hero uh, to a Nazi monster. What do we know about him and his war record? Well, here's the thing. We, we know very little about Mr. Hunka and his war record. He's 98 years old. Uh, I had believed that the last Nazi standing was Helmut Oberlander, who was a translator for uh, an, an SS killing unit in, in eastern Galicia. Um, but we do know that uh, many of his unit, the 14th Division Galicia Waffen SS, made their way into Canada um, and faced no uh, recriminations as, as a result of that. So I wasn't entirely surprised to hear that there were still some left. I was entirely surprised to see him lauded in the gallery of the House of Commons. Uh, Poland has called for Hunka to be extradited. Do you think that should happen? I, I, I think it's a kind of a bit of a sideshow. Uh, we don't have uh, that we know of any evidence specifically against Mr. Hunka. We do know, of course, about his Waffen SS unit, and we do know that the, there's a great possibility that of the 5,000 that were members there, Many may have partaken in uh, in war crimes. After all, the Waffen SS were involved. Today, September 29th, is the 82nd anniversary of the massacre at Babi Yar in, in in the Ukraine. 33,000 Jews were murdered there, and we know that the Waffen SS played a significant role in that murder. So um, it's it's possible that uh, he or others played some roles, but we just don't have that kind of evidence. And I think it's a sideshow. I think we have to look at the fact that. All these people, all these war criminals or alleged war criminals came into Canada. How did this happen? Why did this happen? And why are we still talking about it in 2023 without these answers? I, I would assume that the revulsion towards Nazis and what they did would have been, you know, especially strong in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, how did someone who served with the Nazi unit get into Canada? 
It's quite the opposite, as a, ma as a matter of fact. It was easier for a Nazi, believe it or not, to come into Canada at the end of World War II than it was for a Jewish refugee. And why was that? The Canadian government, the, Brit the Brits, the Americans, they were looking for anti-communists. And my colleague, the late uh, Irving Abella, Professor Irving Abella, history professor at, uh, at York University, former president of Canadian Jewish Congress, he used to say that some of these people would actually show up at immigration and, and, and lift up their left arm and show their SS tattoo, which de denoted that they were, of course, anti-communist, and they actually got into the country. There are stories like that. So th the fact that they got in is not surprising. I think we have to look at the journey that they took to get into Canada. And it's, it's, a, it's a complex and complicated one. They, they surrendered to the British uh, at the end of the war. They ended up in Great Britain. And the British authorities actually convinced Canadians to take a, a large group, up to 2,000, um, of these uh, alleged uh, Waffen-SS people. They weren't alleged. They actually were Waffen-SS people, saying that they had done a check on them and that they seemed to be OK. That's how they got here. They walked in here, as I said, unencumbered. They lived here. They raised families here. They, I don't think they ever gave a second thought uh, to, to the fact that they swore a blood oath to Adolf Hitler, that they served under a Nazi regime, the most murderous regime uh, in, the, in the modern, in modern times. Um, and I don't think we, as Canadians, knew, cared less. Um, and certainly our politicians tried to, I think, for the longest time, right yeah. through till today, sweep it under the carpet. Well, for better or worse, we're learning more about our history now. Bernie, uh, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Ian. Coming up, a rare look inside a historic government vault. They're really only showing a partial story, or we're not really seeing any of the Indigenous perspectives. The First Nations treaties and the calls for greater access to them. That's next. On the eve of National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, Canada's future relationship with Indigenous people is on the minds of many. Today, a reminder to remember the past. Inclusive history does not mean that we erase what we know. It means adding to history. Some of that history is in treaties that few Indigenous people have ever seen. Those original documents, some of them two centuries old, remain under strict government custody in the capital region. And recently, CBC News was given rare access. Brett Forrester shares an up-close look. This is where the treaties rest. And so this is the vault. In the bowels of a government preservation center in a secure vault amid rows of priceless artwork and historic treasures, the sacred agreements between First Nations and the Crown lie locked away. So this is where the treaties would be stored? Yes, this is where the treaty is stored. For Manise Young, treaty preservation is a hands-on affair. The Library and Archives Canada official carts this one from the cool climate-controlled vault through the winding concrete of the department's Gatineau, Quebec facility up to a sunny lab on the upper floor. So what we have here is the James Bay Treaty Number 9. It's the um, amendments of the Treaty 9, or adhesions. She traces the fine craftsmanship of this adhesion to Treaty 9 in Ontario, highlighting its ornate gold tooling, black goat leather binding and sturdy parchment pages. With our job in conservation, we're always finding the balance between access, which is what we're doing now, but also the long-term preservation. And Treaty 11... That's the delicate dance now on display. While the public can see these documents on request, few get this close. And while sending them to visit their home First Nations is cumbersome, it does happen, says Young. A lot of people get very emotional as well because these are their ancestors. It's a very big connection to the past. That's the case for lawyer and former Kuchiching First Nation chief Sarah Mainville. She got the chance to see the original Treaty 3 while on loan to the First Nations in that territory in Western Ontario in Manitoba. It's meaningful to, to see the document. And something communities shouldn't have to wait another century and a half to see again, she adds. The Anishinaabe, um, <clears throat> you know, should have more regular visits uh, with, with these documents, you know, shouldn't take... 150th anniversary. 
It's easy to feel the power in that presence. Early treaties looked like this. The Huron Tract Purchase of 1827. It opened up a swath of southern Ontario to European settlement, yet it looks like it was scrawled hastily across this single piece of now faded parchment. Compare that with these copies of Treaty 11 or the Williams Treaties, both signed roughly a century later. The careful crafting signals the evolution of treaty making in a new country, but it can't conceal the colonial intent. They're really only showing a partial story. Um, we're not really seeing any of the Indigenous perspectives of that documented record. The prevailing attitude at the time was that Indigenous people were going to disappear and assimilate into mainstream culture. So what does reconciliation look like in here, the Canadian government's official memory? That's a key question for a department that hasn't escaped criticism amid calls for all sectors of society to contribute. It's more than a little ironic for Claudette Commanda to learn where the treaties live. And they steal drawers. Yeah. Her people, the Algonquin Nation, never signed a treaty, meaning the land that both Gatineau and Ottawa occupy was never surrendered by First Nations. Just one of many hard truths she says the country isn't ready to hear. There are many deniers out there that feel that the treaties mean nothing, that the land was meant to be taken. So are they ready? Is Canada ready for the truth? No. And while reconciliation may be messy, she says this solution is simple. The government should be working with First Nations, with Treaty Nations, to ensure that the First Nations, they have the ownership, the control and the management of the treaties that belong to them. Is that what reconciliation would look like in this case? Absolutely. Absolutely. A conversation for another day, perhaps. But for now, it's back to the vault. So, Brett, how has the government responded to that suggestion that we just heard that First Nations should have a greater say in how their own treaties are managed. Well, there would very likely have to be some direction from the minister in charge of Library and Archives Canada for First Nations to get actual control and ownership of their own treaties, not just occasional access. We contacted the office of newly sworn in Heritage Minister Pascal Saint-Ange for a reaction. They had no comment, Ian, and just redirected the question back to the archives. All right, Brett, thank you. Coming up, a complete stranger whose donation made him a comic book hero. Like, I, I had all of this. The okay. alien agenda, yeah, yeah, I yeah. had all of it. Okay. The emotion from one comic book collector to another. Next, in our moment. These two, Barney Tama on the left and Gord McRae on the right, were complete strangers until last month when Gord saw Barney on CBC News. Barney had just lost his home and his collection of 34,000 comic books to a wildfire in BC's interior. What Gord did next is our moment. Totally. Hey, man. My pleasure, my pleasure. Really. Oh, man, honestly. Well, I was watching Situation on Fires on CBC News, and I saw Barney interviewed, and he was just describing how he'd lost his whole house. I lost everything. 34,000 comics gone. That was my retirement fund. And I just thought, well, I've got a collection, a few boxes, and uh, it made sense to me to, wow. to do something kind. Well, these are what we call square bound. Oh yeah, okay. So the, like I, I had all of this, the okay. alien agenda. Yeah, yeah. I had all of it. Okay. I just, when you see them that you lost and then they're right here now, <laughs> oh right. my God, really? It's totally awesome. To, to, get, to get some back, can't thank you enough, it's beyond words. The generosity and the joy really is beyond words. Our, our producer, by the way, says his uncle had some great Conan the Barbarian comics that he lost in a flood. So if you know Andrew's uncle and have a few of those comics lying around, want to help him out, we'll connect you. That is The National for September 29th. Join me Sunday for Cross Country Checkup on CBC Radio and CBC News Network. And later that night right here for The National. Have a great Saturday.